Thanks very much, everyone. Um, welcome to um, a special lecture, a talk by Professor Seth Lloyd. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce him. He's a friend of mine and one of the pioneers of the field of quantum information and computation. Um, he's, um, he's actually contributed to it a great deal, but if you look at his um, PhD thesis, in fact, part of the work was also on the gravitational side. And I think this is the first time I'm watching him speak about the gravity side of things, not about the quantum side of things. So I think it's all going to be uh, new to me as well. Um, he's um, spending his sabbatical here with us. Um, at some point, we had to compete with Rome. So it was either Rome or, or, or Oxford. Ultimately, Seth said it was going to be Oxford because the food is much better here, of course. Um, <laughs> Um, after that, I was very happy, actually, that um, Lillian uh, very kindly donated a visiting research professorship for, for him. So she's supporting, actually, this uh, research, which is, of course, why we are hosting the talk today uh, here. I'm not going to actually keep you too long. Um, I find it amazing that despite the weather conditions, all of you have showed up, actually. This is a great test to how exciting something is, actually. Um, and uh, what I wanted to say is that I, don't, I hope I'm not uh, kind of um, disclosing any secrets at this stage. I think Seth is finalizing his second popular book. His first popular book, Programming the Universe, has been extremely uh, popular actually and uh, tells you a little bit uh, uh, in very simple terms about the field of quantum computation. I think he's about to submit or release his... Far from it. Far from it. <laughs> anyway, so you're the first to probably hear about some of the topics that uh, he'll be telling us. So he's, um, he's a professor of quantum mechanical um, engineering as well as physics physics at MIT, but like, like I said, we are very lucky to have him here actually for the whole of this year. There will be afterwards um, a drinks reception, so you will get a chance to interact with Seth a little bit longer after his talk. Over to you. Thank you very much. Here, here, here's a pound, you're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> Pay to play. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Vladko, and um, I'd like to thank the Martin School in general for their hospitality during my time here, and Lillian Martin in particular for supporting being here. The Martin School, as you guys know, because you're here, is a wonderful place, and uh, I've benefited a great deal from their series of talks about sustainability. I, I would say that going to these talks was the first time in the last 10 years that I've really had some kind of hope for sustainability and for the future. Um, so, this is a wonderful institution, and I'm very happy and proud to be part of it. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, the black hole of finance. Uh, uh, let's see if I can get, work this out. I, I, this is, um, these are my PowerPoint slides. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think PowerPoint is really a tool of Satan, actually, at some <laughs> level. Um, you know, it's made for businessmen to convince other businessmen of things that aren't true. So. How much more appropriate to use it for scientific exposition? Uh, uh, anyway, th this is a project that I conceived of during the financial crisis in 2008. Um, uh, 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 the, what was going on was, you may remember, is that there were these investment banks. Here's a picture of Lehman Brothers looking very traditional bankish. And all of a sudden, they found that they were highly leveraged, and when things went bad, they were overextended, the margin calls came in, they were just bleeding out money, and then their core business imploded, and they collapsed, spewing out debt and people and all kinds of stuff around. And I said, hey, this reminds me of the formation of a supermassive black hole in the early universe. Uh, it, it burns through its nuclear fuel in the course of a few hundred million years, and then it can no longer support the gravitational pressure from the outside. The core collapses to form a black hole. The outer part blows off into a supernova. And it, indeed, these cores are what people are seeing of colliding black holes or what people are seeing in LIGO today. So it was a, a very alarming time. And after a while, I said, you know, maybe this is not just a metaphor. Maybe I 
could make this into a more precise mathematical analog. And um, you know, that, would, that might make me feel better because my life savings were going down the tube and there was nothing to do about this. This was true of anybody who had any savings at that time, billionaires included. But as, as a scientist, you know, if you can understand something, you might feel better about it, even if it sucks. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, so I did that. And I've been working on this for the last 10 years. On and off, I haven't given up my day job. Uh, uh, believe me, this is a bit like, you know, playing in your band in a rock club at night. <clears throat> so what were we going to talk about? Oh, yeah, so, so this is, um, since I give most of my talks on the board, I'm often surprised as you as what's going to come up. This is a picture of Irving Fisher. Who here has heard of Irving Fisher? Yeah, the economists in the audience know about him. He was really the first superstar economist in the United States. He, he uh, was the first person to get a PhD in economics from Yale in the 1890s. And he was a very well-known and respected economist working on the theory of utility and general equilibrium. And on October 13th, 1929, which was nine days before Black Thursday, uh, uh, he said, stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. And then afterwards, he actually went, he, in between then and Black Tuesday, he, he had a meeting with a whole bunch of influential bankers arguing why the apparently exorbitantly high valuations of companies was perfectly fine, made perfect sense. And then, of course, he watched his reputation and actually most of his life savings as well plummet after that point. And he spent the next decades of his life you know, trying to make sense of what went happened and, um, and uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, regain his reputation, which he did to some degree. <clears throat> he will figure quite prominently in what happens next, because I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> uh, a theory, a mathematical, what is this? Well, what the, the, of course, the other reason for writing such a paper or a series of papers is just to have a paper called The Black Hole of Finance, right? I mean, this makes sense. It's like, uh, this is, I wouldn't be the first person to use this as a metaphor. Uh, indeed, a, a, a colleague of mine in investment told me at that time in 2008, Parmalat, the big Italian conglomerate, had a series of investment vehicles named after stellar bodies like you know, the Cosmos Fund and the Galaxy Fund and you know, the Comet Fund. And they actually had a black hole fund, which in the collapse made true to its namesake. <laughs> so what I'm going to tell you about um, today is a mathematical analog between gravitational and economic systems. And I'm just going to spell it out what happens in here, in this theory. There's going to be, we'll see, there, I, I will present a bunch of math just so my more mathematically inclined colleagues can jump up and say, no, they were absolutely wrong, right? But um, <clears throat> the way that this works out is that there is a general tendency in the universe and in human societies and actually everywhere for entropy and information to increase. And this increase in entropy and information, if you don't know what entropy is, I'll, we'll, tell, we'll explore it. This, entropy in, in, this increase in entropy and information has a natural tendency to cause energy and capital to clump and to aggregate. And this leads to the creation, the spontaneous creation of complex physical and financial systems. But the very same feature that causes energy and money and assets to clump and aggregate also leads to their destruction. For example, here, that, that you can think of, oh, well, energy clumps and aggregates. You know, the, the, the stars start to shine because it gets so clumpy and dense that nuclear fusion starts. But that exact same tendency, taken a little too far, leads to collapse. Um, <clears throat> all right. So <clears throat> let's look at how this works. So let's first start talking about creation. So this is, this is a picture of the universe. Uh, time is at the bottom and goes up. Um, one thing, Vladko, you should know and talks about gravitation is that, you know, for a physicist, for engineers, time goes from left to right. And for physicists, it goes from right to left. Uh, and sometimes it goes from top to bottom. But for people in cosmology, it always goes from bottom to top, which I think is a lovely thing. It sort of suggests the universe growing out of its roots like a tree. Now, the way that the accepted theory of cosmology works right now 
is that 13.79 billion years ago, there was a gigantic explosion happening everywhere in the universe at once called the Big Bang. Um, by the way, when I was a, a youngster taking, taking a course in quantum gravity from Stephen Hawking at Cambridge, uh, the age of the universe was somewhere between 8 billion years and 50 billion years. And then I woke up one morning and read in the New York Times that it was 13.8 billion years old. And then they said, oh, it's actually 13.79 billion years old. And this, I believe, is called progress. Um, <clears throat> uh, but what happens is, before the Big Bang, there's an era called inflation, where it, everything, the state of the universe is an extremely regular and pure state. And it has very high energy density. And this is, causes this, the size of the universe to double in scale very rapidly every tiny fraction of a second. Then, because this system is unstable, for reasons that we'll see in just a second, um, it's unstable that a tiny bubble of ordinary matter forms. And this ordinary matter rapidly heats to a very, very high temperature. So at the Big Bang, what you have is ordinary stuff at temperatures of billions, de billions of degrees. And it's all at the same temperature everywhere. It's extremely regular and homogeneous. There's essentially no structure, almost no structure, except for a few tiny, tiny ripples left over from inflation, which is why we think that this pre-Big Bang happened. Now, this is actually very odd. Um, no, this is actually, well, it's being at thermal equilibrium at high temperature is normal from a physics perspective, but it's actually very odd from an ordinary physics perspective that we should get this formation of all these different kinds of structure. Ordinarily, if you're, you know, if you're at thermal equilibrium at a high temperature, you remain at thermal equilibrium at a high temperature, at least in a closed system, and the universe, by definition, doesn't have anything outside of it. Um, actually, though, you, you, if you think this is bizarre, what, what actually happens in, the, in cosmology, and I, I kid you not, this is what the theory is, is that this inflation is going outside of our universe, shown by this, these green lines right here. This inflation is still going on, and other little bubble universes are forming and expanding, maybe with laws of physics that are entirely different from ours. Um, Luckily, we can't talk to them and they can't talk to us because we're surrounded by stuff that's expanding in scale by, you know, a tiny, every tiny fraction of a Planck scale of doubles in size, so it's tough to talk with them. However, the universe is still expanding. Our universe, our bubble universe, is still expanding. And what happens is that this high temperature stuff cools down, and as it cools down, stuff, matter, and energy begins to clump and to aggregate. Again, this is very strange from the perspective, if I just look at you know, a bunch of hot molecules that's in a piston, and I expand it by moving the piston back, the stuff will just cool down. It's not going to clump and, and aggregate. It will remain basically uniformly spread out. But because of the very special nature of gravitation, which translates also into finance, what happens is that little overdensities of matter become more and more dense. They become hotter and hotter. And the first stars begin to form. These are these supermassive stars that run through their nuclear fuel in a few hundred million years and then collapse into black holes and supernovae. Then galaxies begin to form. Here's some cloud of dust. I don't know what these are, some interstellar comets. Stars begin to shine. And then things like uh, solar systems, our sun comes into existence. Our sun is a second generation star. It came into just existence billions of years after the Big Bang. And Earth and junk forms around it, forming planets, and then you get all kinds of structure, the amazing structures we see in the universe today. Okay, so that's kind of it. So this is, you know, uh, this talk is about creation and destruction in life, the economy, and the universe. So I thought I'd talk about creation to begin with, because actually most of what I'm going to talk about is actually destruction. Isn't that cheery? So, <laughs> okay, so why does this happen? So with ordinary particles in a box, as I was describing, the maximum entropy, and entropy is the stuff that's supposed to always increase in the second law of thermodynamics. So the maximum entropy is having the particles spread out in a roughly uniform distribution of, of particle mass and energy density. But if I have an expanding box, and if I have a long-range interaction from gravity, then for reasons that we'll go into a little bit, 
then what happens is the maximum entropy is obtained when parts of it clump together and move together really faster, and other parts spread out and move around slower. The clumpy parts get hotter and hotter. They give up energy to the cooler parts, which are less and less and less dense, and this just continues. It clumps further and further and further until stars begin to shine. Again, I mean, if you're not familiar with this, this is pretty odd from a physics kind of perspective, and there are very few systems apart from self-gravitating systems that do this in ordinary physical situations. Okay, now, okay, here, here are some equations. So, so now, um, I told you there would be a bit of math. Again, I said it so that my mathematical colleagues can tell me that I'm wrong. Um, if, uh, I know that there are some people here who are not that fond or interested in, in equations, and this is totally okay, because everything's gonna be explained by pictures also. Even, you know, when I actually review some paper and I'm reading the paper and I come across an equation and it takes forever to try to understand what it means, even if you're supposed to know how to like parse this equation. So I often um, uh, do something that I learned from the cartoon Peanuts. Who here is familiar with Peanuts? All right, so in this particular cartoon, Charlie Brown is talking with Linus and Charlie Brown says, oh Linus, I see you're reading Brothers Karamazov. And Linus says, yes, I am, it's very good. And Charlie Brown says, but don't you get confused by all those long Russian names? Because you know, in these Russian novels, everybody has like seven different names according to who's talking. And Linus says, oh no, when I find one I don't, I don't understand who it is, I just bleep right over it, okay? So this is very useful with equations and things. You could, if you find an equation, you don't understand it, just bleep right over it and you'll probably understand what happens. Actually, there are probably graduate students here and I shouldn't be telling them this. Uh, <coughs> okay, so here's what's happening energetically. So in, here we have this self-gravitating system. It's got a bunch of energy and the energy is the sum of its kinetic energy, the energy that comes from particles of dust and molecules moving around. This kinetic energy is positive. And then it has its gravitational potential energy. Gravity is an attractive force, and what this actually means in terms of the potential energy is the potential energy is negative. Now the energy, which is the sum of the kinetic plus the potential energy, is conserved. But then there's a very beautiful theorem that dates to the first half of the 19th century called the Virial Theorem. Uh, uh, I, it, it's too bad if it, it had been created more recently, it could have gone viral, but it, uh, it's just virial. <laughs> and it says that on average, in a self-gravitating, a clump of matter that's held together by its own gravitational energy, the average kinetic energy is minus one-half the potential energy. So potential energy is negative, kinetic energy is positive. This is from stuff moving around, this is just like from gravitational attraction. It says that, so the, the gravitational energy is twice the magnitude, its magnitude is twice the magnet of the kinetic energy. It's actually, for those who want to look it up, it's not that hard to show. It's a very lovely theorem. And what that means is that if I have something like this, here's a, a gravi self-gravitating clump of stuff, these little dots represent the potential energy, the gravitational attraction, the arrows represent the kinetic energy, what happens is it, it naturally forms a structure with a core that has a, where things are moving around faster, and a halo where thing are, things are moving around slower. Uh, we'll return to this structure at the end of this talk. And what the ha happens is, is the core loses energy by say, you know, some, ver some particle like flies off to infinity or out to the halo. It means that its negative potential energy gets larger in magnitude, which means its kinetic energy also gets larger, so it heats up, things move around faster. Meanwhile, the halo gains energy, it expands, and things move slower. So you have this very funny situation where the thing that is losing energy gets hotter, and the thing that is gaining energy gets slower. Now this ain't what a cup of tea does. You know, if I make a cup of tea and I put it on the counter, and it loses energy by radiating out heat to the surroundings, because it's hotter, it gets colder. It doesn't get hotter. Hot baths get colder. Hot cups of tea get colder. If it, if it had what's called negative specific heat, which means 
essentially, if you lose energy, you get hotter, and if you gain energy, you get colder, then you know, you would be a pretty dangerous situation because I'd make my cup of tea, I put in the tea bag, I go over to the fridge to go get the milk, and meanwhile, the cup of tea is heating up and heating up, and it will just explode. <clears throat> so from this example, you can see that the cup of tea, instead of cooling down until it's the same temperature as the room, which would be a stable thermodynamic equilibrium, is actually unstable. So systems, these self-gravitating systems with negative specific heat have an unstable, they're unstable, they're intrinsically unstable. And this is this intrinsic instability which is responsible for clumping, for the creation of stars and planets, and as we'll see in the case of economic systems for the aggregation of capital and for money and debt to tend to aggregate in particular places. Uh, but I want to point out how weird this all is from a physical perspective. It's really only in these gravitational systems and in some other wacky like nanoscale systems where you see this negative specific heat. But it exhibits an intrinsic instability. And it's this intrinsic instability that gives us uh, this formation of structure in the universe. Okay, so let's actually compare this to what happens economically. And here's my little sketch of economic creation. So um, this is going to be a happy creative story, just like the way the creation of the universe is a happy creative story. Here, here's our entrepreneur. She's got a bright idea. She explains it to some venture capitalists who say, hey, this is a cool idea. We could make money off of this. Um, by the way, in the theory of quantum information, the, bizarrely, Vladko will tell you, you know, after, after decades of it being simply something rather academic, now since Google and Microsoft and Intel and IBM and Huawei and Tencent are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in it, all these startups are just popping out like mad. And, um, and I actually, this is good for me because I actually give, get to give venture capitalists advice on whether it will work. And I say, well, no, this is not likely to work. Right? Because, you know, it's just extremely risky. It's going to be very hard to do. And they say, that's fine. <clears throat> you know, we understand that, you know. As long as I can make back 10 times my investment in the future, then that's okay. <clears throat> By the way, I was talking um, with Fortini Marco Pulo, uh, Don Farmer, who's married to Don Farmer. She has a startup, and she said that in, in the United Kingdom, if you talk to venture capitalists, the first question they ask is not, you know, is it likely to fail, but will it make me a lot of money is, but are you going to guarantee that I'll get my money back? So, <clears throat> which is a difference. <clears throat> okay, so she, she communicates. She's building up information, mutual shared information with uh, this venture capitalist. And by the way, communication, communicare is a Latin word that means to build together. Communication is building things together via the exchange of information. That's what it means. Okay, the venture capitalist says, cool. I'll fund you, and eventually she even manages to go to a, a, an investment bank. She signs an IRU. The investment bank gives her a bunch of money to invest. Now she's happy. You know, she's, she's seeing this green stuff means her idea is going to come to fruition. And then she uh, acquires more debt, acquires these assets, builds things up, and you can see that her device, this is a, in, in honor of the Martin School and Sustainability, is some device with a magic cable that goes in the roots of trees. Here's a little owl right there. And the, the, the sustainable doesn't hurt the owls at all. You know, she has to plant all the trees. It's planting more forests. It's great all around. And it uh, generates an electrical current, which in turn lights up this light bulb here. This would be a great thing if you could do it. I actually was talking to someone who has a company to do exactly this. The problem is that your average tree produces like a few hundred milliwatts of power from its roots, so it might take a lot of trees. OK. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is, if you were here the last time I talked a few years ago, I was talking about photosynthesis. We can talk about that at another time. All right. So let's now actually see how this analogy plays itself out. This analogy between thermodynamics. And I, what I'm going to start is giving you actually a known analog between ordinary thermodynamics, you know, how heat and entropy and you know, volume and temperature work, and classical economics. Interestingly, uh, such analogs have been around for a very long time. There's, uh, ever since, basically since Newton, people who wanted to study human beings had the ambition of, I'm going to make the analog of Newton's laws, laws for social systems. We were talking about this today. Um, 
uh, and you know, you look at all the great sociologists, you know, social scientists, people or, or natural philosophers in social systems like, like Ketele, like Pareto, like Ricardo, um, and they are, and they have the ambition to kind of make make the analog of Newton's laws for social systems. The only person who didn't, I think, was Marx. Um, but in classical economics, starting in the nineteenth in the nineteenth century, the late nineteenth century, people started to say, "Hey, you know, there's stuff that people are exchanging, and you know, these things are kind of conserved, and things move in a direction which we can describe by some kind of potential, and they'll move in this way or that way." Um, this is uh, uh, Irving Fisher again. This is um, uh, Leon Walras, uh, famous, <laughs> I know it's whimsical, right, you know, <laughs> famous Swiss, Swiss uh, mathematical economist. This, by the, this is Poisson down here, uh, you know, the famous French mathematician who, as an example of someone who applied, he's really one of the first people to apply ideas of statistics to, uh, to social systems. He wrote a famous book called um, Sur les jugements justes, Sur les jugements justes, on the theory of just judgments, in which he argued that jurors, juries should have 12 people because the worst thing a society can do is to condemn an innocent person, and if there's some probability that each juror will mistakenly give a vote of guilty, then you shouldn't you know, just leave it up to one person, you should have more people. And uh, he estimated, using Poisson processes, that uh, you should have 12. It's a wonderful piece of work. I also bring in Poisson because the theory that I'm going to describe to you is based basically on statistics and probabilities. Now, who are these people here? So these people up here are Duncan Foley and Eric Smith, who actually, if you want to go and look at this in mathematical detail, they wrote a very nice paper recently summarizing what had been done and carrying through this analog, which I'll tell you about on the next slide. But this up here, this is Josiah Willard Gibbs, the, really the most famous American applied mathematician of the 19th century, along with uh, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann and James Clark Maxwell, he developed our theory of statistical mechanics. You know, he, he was a professor at Yale. Um, and uh, uh, Einstein's, when Einstein wrote his famous papers on statistical mechanics, afterwards he read Gibbs's papers and said, oh, if I'd known that Gibbs had done it so much better than I had, I wouldn't have written the papers, right? <clears throat> so why is he here? Well, recall that Fisher was the first uh, Economist. He was one of the very first economists, people to get a PhD in economics, and one of the first economists, in, the first person from Yale to get a uh, PhD in economics. So who was his supervisor? It was Gibbs. And in Fisher's PhD thesis, um, you can find a detailed analog between statistical mechanics, thermodynamics, and economic behavior and the theory of utility. Indeed, Gibbs was so mechanically minded that he built a complicated hydraulic machine, which, you know, when you, when you move supply up like this and demand up like this, the interest rate would go like that. So the, the whole connections between economics and physics, this is not a new thing that I'm trying to do. Of course, nobody's ever had anything quite as successful as Newton's laws in uh, social systems, which we should not expect because people don't behave in as predictable a way as atoms and molecules. All right, so let's look at how this analogy works. So again, there's some more equations here. Um, uh, in thermodynamics, what happens in thermodynamics? This is a class, uh, a flash course in thermodynamics. Don't worry, the exam at the end of the, if you're still here by the end, will be multiple choice, okay? <laughs> um, you have a quantity called entropy. And when entropy was first defined, it was kind of some kind of mysterious quantity. It's not clear what it is. But as a function, people knew it was a function of quantities such as energy, volume, and number of molecules that are conserved under transactions. So, you know, if I have a hot gas and it gives up some energy to a cold gas, then the energy of the hot gas decreases by delta E. The energy of the cold gas increases by delta E. This is the first law of thermodynamics. It says energy is conserved. And then the second law of thermodynamics says that this quantity, entropy, tends to increase. Um, 
So that interactions and flows of energy, volume, particle, volume like in a piston that's moving in and out, um, and particle numbers between systems redistributes this energy and the relative volumes and the number of particles between the different parts of the system that tend to increase in a way that tends to increase entropy. And thermodynamic equilibrium is considered to be the maximum of entropy. Okay, so um, how does this play out in classical economics? So in economics, you have this other, uh, another mysterious quantity called utility. You know, utility was an idea, I believe, that it first came from David Hume, who said that people behave in ways to you know, maximize their happiness and utility. And then Jeremy Bentham took it and ran with it, um, uh, founding the field of utilitarianism. Uh, <clears throat> and um, economists then took off with this and said, well, you know, often we see people behaving in ways where they don't seem to be maximizing, you know, they're increasing their, their amount of money they have or, or goods. So they must be increasing something. So let's call that thing utility. Okay. That's what they called it. Um, uh, by the way, I'm not claiming that current economists believe in utility. In fact, even by, by the uh, end of the 19th century, people were questioning, does this thing actually exist? Just like entropy, before I tell you some more about it, utility is hard to measure. And so it works like this. So, so Vlad, do you think you can come up here with the, the pound that I just gave you? I knew you were going to use me. Uh, yeah, of course. I, I'm use, always using it. <clears throat> right, so if you, you don't have the pound, you may, I'll, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take two. Other, actually, <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> you give me that pound, I'll give you this apple. All right? So, A. The pound and the apple are transactionally con conserved. I have one fewer apple, Vladko has one more apple. Uh, Vladko has one fewer pound, I have one more pound. Now, of course, you know, okay, I'll keep both of these, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, it's too bad that Don Farmer isn't here because um, Don is um, an old friend of mine, and I gave a talk at the Santa Fe Institute back in the 1980s where I was using an apple as a prop to demonstrate the uses, the various uh, manifestations of information in an apple, of which there are many. There's DNA, there's free energy, there's you know, smell and taste. Anyway, the apple disappeared partway through because some guy had stolen it. So I sat down and said, you know, give me the apple back or I won't finish the talk. So I got the apple back. And then I foolishly said, I challenge anybody to take this apple away from me. And at the end of the talk, Doan jumped me and tried to take the apple away from me. And we were struggling and banging into things and knocking over chairs, and the apple was reduced to bits. <laughs> OK. At any rate, <laughs> assuming you agree or believe in something like utility, what classical economics does is it says that agents engage in transactions that redistribute dollars and goods, like apples, in ways that increase their, the agent's, utility. Right. And this is a whole, the mathematics of these, and I encourage you to look at this paper by Foley and Smith, the mathematics are identical. Whether you believe that this is, you know, what happens economically or not. All right. So but there's something, I, when I first studied thermodynamics in high school, I was like, but what is this entropy stuff anyway? This does, I mean, I never understood this. I always found it very confusing. There were too many equations. Equations didn't make sense. And then when I studied economics in, in college, you know, utility, how do, how do you measure utility? And the graduate student who was in charge of my section in Ec 10 at Harvard said, oh, well, it's easy, you know, if, if, you know, the, if A is willing to give an apple to B and B is willing to give a, a dollar or a pound to A, then, um, you know, they value this at the same utility. So, but, you know, it's not defined in any way. It's very, what does it mean? It's a self-referential kind of definition. Well, I'm going to propose, uh, and this is probably the, the primary proposal of this theory that I'm going to tell you about, a different measure of what we mean by utility. And to do that, I'm going to go and tell you what entropy actually is. So entropy is information. What is information? Well, information is, you know, well, it's the kind of stuff that I'm communicating to you right now. Um, it's what we find in books. It's what we find in computers with, you know, capacitor charged as a zero, capacitor uncharged as a one. It's not, you know, any mystery to people or it's not, not a secret that we're going through this information processing revolution. And the way that information processing works at its most elemental scale in your smartphone and your computers is that you have bits. A bit represents two possibilities. 
two bits, you know, they could be zero or one conventionally, but it could be anything. It could be yes or no, true or false, happy or unhappy. Two bits, you have four possibilities, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Three bits, you have eight possibilities, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. And you see why I'm not going on? Because the number of possibilities grows exponentially in the number of bits. If I have capital N possibilities, then I have little n is equal to the logarithm to the base two n bits. So, uh, equivalently, the number of possibilities is the number of bits, uh, two raised to the power the number of bits. So, now the, the whole theory of information, the mathematical theory of information and computation were worked out in the 20th century by people like Claude Shannon, and the, the notion of bit was coined by John Tukey at IBM in the uh, 1930s. Um, but actually, interestingly, this, this kind of formula, that number of bits is equal to the logarithm of the number of possibilities, was discovered in the 19th century, and it was discovered by Boltzmann, Maxwell, and Gibbs in order to work out what this funny quantity entropy was. Indeed, if you go to Vienna and you look at Boltzmann's grave in Vienna, by the way, I didn't draw it, but if you, if you, if you look under Google Images for Boltzmann's grave, it's got Boltzmann looking pretty darn scary there. <laughs> Underneath the formula, S is equal to K log W. Now, S is entropy. W is the number of possible states of atoms in a gas, for example, or you know, molecules in a liquid, or the atoms in my body, or you know, the atoms in a star. Uh, complexions is the word that Max Planck used for these different possibilities. Um, and by the way, Max Planck came up with this word because he was inventing quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics is the way that allows you to count the number of possible states. Actually, indeed, this, this uh, quantity k, 1.38 times 10 to minus 23 joule per degree Kelvin, which we call Boltzmann's constant, was for the first 10 years of the 20th century called Planck's constant, until people realized that Planck had his own other constant and was too confusing. So Boltzmann might be a little annoyed to find us on his gravestone. But you see what this means is that entropy phrased in terms of information, entropy is proportional to the amount of information in bits required to describe where all the little molecules in the gas are and what their velocities are, up to the accuracy allowed by the laws of quantum mechanics. And that's what entropy actually is. Um, if you didn't know it, then we've communicated. But this is an amazing, actually an amazing discovery, one of the most amazing discoveries in all the history of physics. And Really, I mean, Maxwell, Boltzmann, and Gibbs, they, they didn't say, oh, it's information, you know, it's bits of information. They just said, here's this formula. This is what entropy is. And then when Shannon came along and said, hey, look, I've got this formula, information for a number of bits, he went to John von Neumann and said, what should I call this? And von Neumann said, you should call it H, because that's what Boltzmann called it. All right. So let me, uh, let me say, well, let's look at the, this second law of thermodynamics, and let's make this kind of physical. And this is a, a model that was give, made by Paul Ehrenfest around in the first decade of the 20th century. It's called the urn model. You've got a couple of urns, and you've got some atoms um, or balls. This is the very simplest one. There's two urns. We'll call them zero and one uh, <laughs> for reasons that, well, should be obvious. And a ball in this zero urn, that's like a zero. And when the ball moves to the one urn, then this bit flips. It goes from zero and one. So I have a physical manifestation of a bit, and I have a notion of you know, this is a one-bit system. Now, Ehrenfest said, well, why, why should the amount of information or entropy in the system increase? He said, well, let's suppose we have two urns, and they have a, a very different number of balls. This one has more balls. This one has less balls. And the rule is you pick a ball from an urn at random, and then you replace it into an urn at random. And not surprisingly, after you wait for a long time, you find that the number of balls in both urns is roughly equal. Now, why is that? And Aaron Fest said, well, let's look at the number of ways of distributing balls between urns. If I have n1 balls in the first urn, n2 balls in the second urn, then the, the to total number of ways of doing this is I've got n factorial ways of putting the balls in the urns. I can put n1 in the first, n2 in the second. This is, you know, n choose n1 or n choose n2. And this gives us a simple formula when the dust is cleared for entropy in terms of the probabilities of finding a ball in this urn 
or in that urn. And this is this famous formula that was discovered by Maxwell and Boltzmann and Gibbs in the 19th century. But this reaches its maximum for essentially equal number of balls in the urn. So Ehrenfest said, hey, look, on average, entropy tends to increase, and you're going to end up with an equal distribution of balls. Is this OK? This is a, this is a famous, you know, you don't have to like go through the math to realize, yeah, you know, if I pick them out at random, I replace them at random, eventually I'm going to end up with roughly equal numbers. And this was Aaron's first way of making sense of how entropy increases. Let's go how Boltzmann looked at it, or actually, let's first look at information in a computer. So I actually claim that information has a very strong tendency to increase in a very specific way that I'm going to tell you about right now. Here's a, a little logic gate in a computer. It's called a controlled not gate. And the rule is A is the control, and you flip B, or perform a not operation, if A is equal to 1. So entropy tends to increase. So if A starts out as being 0 or 1, B is 0. Afterwards, A is 0 and B is 0, or A is 1 and B is 1. And if you do the entropy or information accounting, originally A can be in two possibilities. That's one bit. B is in only one possibility, so that's zero bits. And the two systems together have two possibilities, so the two things together have one bit to be together with them. Afterwards, A has one bit. It could be 0 or 1. B has one bit. It could be 0 or 1. And A and B together, there's still just two possibilities. Now, what this means is that what's called the mutual information, which is the shared information between A and B, defined as the information of A plus the information of B minus the joint information. Well, that's increased. It went from zero bits, B knew nothing about A, to one bit. B is identical to A. B knows everything about A. So ge quite generically, this mutual information tends to increase. This is a computational example. Let's look how Boltzmann phrased it. Here's B. It's sitting still. It's just a, an, an atom. In comes A. It could either be coming in towards B up here, or it could be coming in down here. There's two possibilities, one bit. Now, afterwards, if A is up here, it boings off Bill like a cue ball off a billiard ball, or snooker ball, sorry, excuse me, off a snooker ball. And A goes up in that direction, and B goes down in that direction. But if A is down here, it bounces off B in this direction, and E oh, on this side of B, B goes up that way, A goes down that way. It's the same accounting. Beforehand, there's one bit not knowing if A is doing this or that. B is right there, zero bits. Information of A and B together is one, so the mutual information is zero bits. Afterwards, if we know which direction A went, we would know which direction B went, and vice versa. Their mutual information is one bit. And this is the basis for Boltzmann's famous H theorem, this exact argument, by the way, which says that the sum of the informations between different things tends to increase. And it tends to increase because interactions and things increase the shared or mutual information. OK, Loschmidt's paradox. Well, Loschmidt said that, OK, this can't happen all the time because if you reverse all the velocities, they've got to go back to their original state. To which Boltzmann, in a Clint Eastwood moment, said, go ahead, reverse them. OK. <laughs> so this can only actually hold in a statistical fashion. But most of the time, it happens. OK. Oh my goodness, here's a picture over this that's perhaps too physics-y. This just like gives you the notion of stable equilibrium. So entropy is increasing. Things are exchanging energy. Here's, if I have an amount of energy delta E going from A to B, what this says here is A, the entropy of A. It goes up as, it, as delta E gets smaller, because A would be losing en energy. The entropy of B goes up as delta E gets bigger. And to maximize the sum of A and B, Here's the sum of A and B. There's some point right here. And uh, uh, entropy, if energy redistributes itself to increase entropy, then what you find is, and uh, this is too busy and too mathematical to slide, is that the temperatures uh, between of A and the temperature of B must be equal. Temperature governs the information cost of entropy. High temperature means a low information cost. Low temperature means a high information cost. So if energy flows from a hot thing to a cold thing, then the hot thing loses a bit of entropy. The cold thing gains a lot more entropy. So entropy increases. And you have equilibrium when these temperatures are equal, which means that these slopes here are equal. And uh, again, I apologize for the messy diagram. <clears throat> OK. 
So let's go on to economics. Now, so what I, I would say is, remember how we had, you know, utility? What the hell is utility? I don't know what, what utility is. Um, but I do know what information is. And, uh, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I'd like to argue that how about just in the same way that Maxwell, Boltzmann, and Gibbs replaced this funny quantity entropy that tended to increase with information, let us replace some notion of utility of how valuable things are with the idea of information. And it's going to be a specific kind of information. I'll call it financial information. And it's equal to the number of bits required to specify how an economic agent can distribute assets and debt, and things like apples as well, like you know, goods, services, assets, and debt. You write down the number of ways that you could do things. You have a bunch of bits that specify how I could distribute this. I choose to give, chose to give the apple to Vladko. He chose to give me a pound. Then I chose to take the apple and the pound back. Right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and this is, a, this is an amount of information that measures the amount of opportunity that you have. Higher amounts of opportunity, more possibilities, more information. By the way, this is a little footnote that says, um, you know, so if I'm hugely wealthy and I choose to invest all my stock in one thing, like Brexit futures, then maybe, uh, you know, maybe that will be simple to describe. But in fact, since I have the opportunity to invest in a large number of things, we look at how my, what my portfolio might look like if I were to maximize my expected return and minimize my risk as opposed to just investing in Brexit futures. So why, why should this increase? Well, it, it increases for a very simple reason. Just in the same way that when molecules and atoms interact, or bits in a computer interact, they increase their mutual or shared information. When economic agents interact, make transactions, sign contracts, make agreements, they increase the mutual information between those agents. You know, what is this mutual information? Well, it's the contract that they signed. The contract says, OK, uh, Vladko, give me an apple today, and I'll give you a pound tomorrow. And here's my IRU for it. I increased information. The amount of information increases. It can't help but do it. It's got to do this. And this is for the very same reason that when atoms interact, they also increase their mutual information. All interactions cause information from one thing to be communicated to and shared with the thing that's interacting with. The second part, which is quite interesting, is if we look in the future, if this financial information is an increasing function of wealth, and if you have a lot more money, then it takes more information to specify the ways you could invest it, then agents will try to interact in ways that increase their future financial information, aka increase their future wealth. This is this feature that, you know, for economists, utility, any Increasing function of utility is also a good utility function. I'm just saying, hey, information, it's a good function for utility. It's not utility, it's information, it's actually number of bits. And indeed, this number could, in principle, be measured. So I put these things together. I call this the second law of finance. I put it in quotes because, you know, let's not get carried away here. We're not talking Newton's laws here. We're talking an ansatz, a guess, to see if we can understand how people act in terms of how they exchange goods and money and information. OK, here's an example. When I get my paycheck, you know, why do I deposit it in my bank? Well. It's because if I just keep it in my mattress, I don't have much opportunities to do this. But the bank has lots of things they can invest in. I give it to them. You know, they can lend out $10 for every dollar I put in. They can loan out money. They can have many, many more, more opportunities for this dollar, and so it's more profitable. And so they pay me interest, because the bank has a higher financial information per dollar than me. Its temperature is lower, if you like. So my money goes from me, high temperature, into the bank at low financial temperature. Of course, you know, I could also, and if I'm hungry, I can also buy an apple from Vladko, assuming he still had it, in order that I may, you know, get the calories I need to go out and work and make some more money, right? So I can invest this as well. So I think if you go and think about different examples of the sort, you will find that, in fact, it's not, you know, this is actually pretty reasonable. I don't claim to approve it. It's a guess or an ansatz. We're going to make this assumption that people operate to increase their you know, net set of opportunities, financially or otherwise. OK, 
So by and large, atoms and physical systems interact ways that increase their future entropy and mutual information. And people, businesses, financial institutions interact in ways that increase their present and future financial information. And financial information is shared information about, you know, give me an apple today and I'll give you a dollar, to, I'll give you a dollar tomorrow or a pound tomorrow. So contracts are mutual information. They're communications that build up a shared understanding. And then you can just go redo all this stuff, and you have all this stuff that's flowing around between systems, energy, volume, particle number, or money, apples. This is a sheep. Um, for people who are buying, I'm sure you were able to tell that that's a sheep, like, like my owl before. Um, <clears throat> uh, people exchange goods and money in ways that that overall increase the amount of entropy in the case of physical systems and, uh, and between the amount of financial information and financial systems. And, you know, by and large, they're trying to do this in ways that, uh, uh, sorry, that increase their overall financial information. It sounds great. We've got a theory of stable equilibrium, you know, Equilibrium, financial, stable equilibrium, uh, market equilibrium is the analog of stable uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. Everything is cool. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, the answer is a lot. And indeed, you may recall that I told you that gravitational systems do not have stable equilibrium. Here's an unstable equilibrium. Here are these curves. Now I do them like this. These curves of, for A and B, their entropy is a function of energy. And now, instead of like being nice and slopey downward, concave, or like that, they're convex. And you look at the curve of their total uh, entropy, you find that the point of equal temperature, where they're at equilibrium, is unstable. The maximum entropy is way over here. You know, so here, the temperature is equal. But it's like these self-gravitating systems. The temperature is equal, but then one of them gets a little more energy and gets colder. The other gets a little less energy, gets hotter. And then all the entropy, the energy start to flow in one direction. It's not stable any longer. And of course, it can be more complicated. Here's B. B is concave. A is convex. Here's their entropy. It's got an unstable equilibrium. It's got a stable equilibrium. But the maximum is still way over on the edge. And this is what happens in these gravitational systems. You draw the curves. Actually, if you draw the curve for the gravitational part and the ordinary matter in stars, it looks like this. Here's the sun shining, nice, shining nicely and stably today. But in the long run, it's unstable and will collapse. And in its case, not form a black hole, but a compact object. It's not going to be very fun to be here when that happens. All right. So what happens at unstable equilibria, and now I'm going to give the analogs for the economic part as well, given this, you know, this mathem mathematical analog that I gave. You know, the mathematical analog is strict, but between thermodynamics and business or economics, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily what happens in the physical systems is the same thing that happens in the economic systems, because lots of stuff can go wrong and people are less predictable than atoms. Well, when you have equal exchange or business as usual, you know, uh, the temperature is the same here. But this is now a minimum of entropy or a minimum of this financial information. It's not a maximum any longer. It's not the best thing to be doing at all. And actually, some of you may remember that during this financial crisis, what happened for a while is that people were trying to do business as usual, exchanging things under the assumption that, you know, oh, I'll buy this option, you know, I'll give this amount of money for this option, and then, you know, I'll make money in the future. The ordinary stuff that seemed to be business as usual and efficient was, in fact, maximally inefficient. It was bad. Now, the other feature here is that the maxima sit on the edge of the allowed region. And if you're here down at this point at equilibrium, you can't, your local cues about which direction to go won't tell you which way to go. So here I am, here's A and B. It's like, hey, which way do we go to find the maximum? Well, B says, oh, I think we should go over here. And A says, well, I think we go over here, but we can't tell. So you might end up going in this direction if B is more persuasive, and you end up at a maximum which is way worse than that maximum over there. And 
as a result, the future behavior is intrinsically unpredictable. Nor can you expect either rational economic actors who are looking out their own interests, nor atoms and molecules, what they're going to do isn't necessarily going to lead them in the right direction, and you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. So this is a bad situation. Let's look at when entropy and information curves are convex. Well, we've already looked at one in physical systems with long-range forces, positive and negative energy. We have gravitation. Here you have this curve of S as a function of E. And economic systems, when does the financial information increase as a function of the amount of money you have? Well, if you have increasing returns, remember this financial information goes up as you make more money. So if your returns you know, per, are, are getting higher as you have more money or more capital invested, then in fact you'll find that this F, your financial information, will grow more rapidly than linearly in the amount of money you have. That's what increasing returns means. And by the way, this is something, you know, when people looked at these, there's a whole vast literature of this kind of not concavity convexity trade-offs in economics. But, you know, there's, starting back in the 1920s, people started to question the efficient market hypothesis and say, hey, hold it, you know, these utility curves, they could look like this, in which case we're screwed. And this happens a lot. You know, this happens with, this is what's going on with Google, you know, and Amazon. Um, you know, they, they have increasing returns, they have more capital, capital flows into them, they use that capital to build up their capacity, to lower their prices, to crowd other people out of the market. And this is certainly describes what's happening in, in the case of Google and Apple. And, you know, in fact, in their case, they're actually generating vast quantities of junk information all the time in the form of, you know, fake news and, you know, vast, you know, trying advertisements that tell you that you need to buy stuff that you don't need at all. Like, there's this gigantic there explosion of information that's going on uh, thanks to this increasing returns. Um, and uh, uh, one that I'll talk about in just a second is if you have leverage, if leverage increases as a function of wealth, then wealthier individuals, such as Lehman Brothers, which has, was leveraged at 31 to 1 at the time of the financial crisis. Let me tell you, you know, if I go to my MIT Federal Credit Union and I say, here's a dollar, give me $31 to play the markets, they'll just laugh. But Lehman Brothers are like, oh, we're very, very smart people. We know exactly what we're doing. You know, we're beautifully hedged. They would go to the bank and they'd say, here's a, you know, here's a billion dollars. And the bank would say, oh, yeah, here's $31 billion to play around with. I mean, that's crazy. And you can see how it's unstable. It's like when they're making money, when everything works, then they have a much higher return for their investment because they're leveraged. But of course, you also see how it's unstable on the destruction side. If stuff goes down, there's a margin call, they have to liquidate their assets to go back, then it goes the other way just as badly. Which, by the way, is just exactly what happened to Lehman Brothers. So, um, by the way, there's other forms of leverage when extremely wealthy people, individuals, or institutions have a lot of money um, to give large amounts of money to political candidates who are in favor of giving them more money than, you know, which is, can be perfectly honest. The political candidates espouse policies that say wealthy people should have more money, and then wealthy people give them money to help them get elected, so wealthy people have more money. There's no, no, no dishonesty there. But, you know, it's not exactly positive, whoops, positive in terms of, of, you know, making the world a better place or, for that matter, generating an efficient distribution of goods and services. Because when this happens, all bets are off in terms of giving an efficient distribution of money, goods, and services. Let me just show a couple of pictures. I'm almost done. I, this is, a, this is a, a fun model I've made. I'll just describe how it works, because it tells you kind of what's going on here. Remember the urn model? Balls, urns, move them around. Let's suppose that we now have positive balls and negative balls, like assets and debt. And if you've got a bunch of assets, you're allowed to go borrow money and create some more positive balls and negative balls, red balls and black balls here. But it's also possible you can create positive and negative energy assets and debt. By the way, this is what happens in the universe. Why do we have all this energy around? The initial energy of the universe was zero. Matter borrowed more matter from the gravitational field, creating negative energy to create a whole bunch more matter and just kept on going and going and going. It's awesome. You know, <laughs> the universe is the ultimate free lunch, as Alan Guth says. But, you know, laws of physics and economics being somewhat reversible, if you have assets and debt, poof, they can go away. You know, you can have a margin call. It says, okay, give me back the money you owe me, all right? Positive and negative energy particles can 
go away into the vacuum. Happens all the time, happening all over the place right in this room right now. Okay, so now let's also allow urns to be created. So if an urn gets really full, you know, it's got a bunch, this one's got very wealthy urn, it's got only one little black ball, a lot of red balls. Then it can, you can form two other urns and distribute your balls amongst them. You kind of see how this is going in terms of the financial side, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, but if you have empty urns that are bankrupt, they can go away. Right? So we'll just make these rules, and then we'll just say some other rules. The rate of creation, destruction, and balls, say, goes up if you're wealthy and goes down if you're poor. If you're bankrupt, you can't create any. And the rate of creation and destruction of urns, well, again, if you've got a lot of money, you can create them. Uh, if you're empty, you go away. So we'll just, you can make any kinds of laws you want about it. But let's, I'm making them this way because it makes some kind of sense. So let's see what happens. Okay, you've got nothing. Creation from nothing. This is what happens in the universe. It's what happens when someone's going as a bright idea and says, oh, I'm going to borrow some money, create some assets, invest them. Oh, we've got, we, we come up, an urn is created out of nothing. And the urn has like two, uh, a piece of uh, positive money and a piece of debt in it, assets and debt that's been created. Well, okay. Because of statistical fluctuations, you're allowed to you know, create other urns, and the balls will redistribute themselves. This one is wealthy. This one is, is underwater, this urn right here. This one, the ones that are wealthy, well, they can create more urns and more, more uh, you know, assets and debt. The other ones kind of go away, or they're kind of stuck doing not creating very much. And then you create more and more and more and more and more. So in this very simple model, which applies very nicely, by the way, to the self-gravitating systems, you have exactly what happens. You have creation out of nothing. You have clumping and concentration. You have growth of inequality. And pretty soon you find that there are a bunch of big players and there are a bunch of really small players, probably obeys some kind of power law. This is always, should always be the case with this kind of thing in terms of the distribution. But <laughs> let's look at this, what this means financially for the moment. I mean, this is financially, this is like, a bunch, if, what would happen if the whole economy were nothing but finance? There's no goods and services. There's just people creating assets and debt and other people gambling on, you know, can I borrow some money now and pay it back for more in the future? And people who look like they're doing well, get more money to play with, can borrow more money. You know, this says, oh, what well, we expect if we just have something that's nothing about goods and services, it's just about finance and gambling. Well, you expect, oh, Pretty soon, you're going to have a bunch of big, wealthy, but heavily indebted actors. They're going to crowd out all the other people, take their money away from them. This, of course, should be completely fair, but it's not you know, like any efficient market or anything like that. It's not a market for anything. It's just finance doing its own thing. I claim that this looks somewhat familiar. All right, we're getting to the end. Vlako will be happy. So <clears throat> uh, I decided to apply these, um, these results to the following situation. It's called a core halo instability. It's something I knew about from doing this work on statistical mechanics and the formation of black holes. This describes the, the, the uh, technical term for what's about to happen. It's called the gravothermal catastrophe. Good name, right? <laughs> gravothermal catastrophe. So let's look at a, a star that's like our sun that's in pretty good shape, our sun has this nice, it's metastable, but it's still very stable, can shine on for billions of years, just kind of doing its thing, getting gradually a little bit hotter as time goes on. You have this hot, dense core with a lot of kinetic and gravitational energy here. Here's the, white, the black balls and the red balls. It's spewing out energy and uh, entropy to this cooler halo. Energy flows from the core to the halo. The, the core gradually gets a little bit hotter as it clumps together more, but it's got all this nuclear fuel to kind of push things out. So it, it, this happens extremely slowly over the many billions of years time frame. Thank goodness. <clears throat> now, in order for this to be stable, the core has to maintain a high temperature and a high rate of energy production. And there are very large internal rates of energy flow and, and information flow in this core as it turbulently shuttles things back and forth. And you can use the, the theory that I was describing to show that this has to happen to make the thing stable. If you have high connectivity between core and halo, the core must have even higher connectivity to make itself stable. This, by the way, is a, 
for folks here at Oxford, um, this is an extension of ideas that Robert May used back in the 70s to apply to interconnectedness of food webs and ecosystems. All right. So, but what happens is when the core and the energy information flows and production slow down, then if the core gets too quiescent, if things like get locked down, what happens is there's no longer enough pressure to talk, push things out out here. And because of gravitational attraction, the energy flows will start to come inwards to the core. So they start coming in and it starts to collapse. Eventually, this negative energy of the core overwhelms its positive energy, leading to collapse and implosion and explosion of energy in bits. The core implodes, as we were talking about at the beginning of this talk, blows off the outer layers. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, this, the, if you actually look at black hole formation, in, if in bankruptcy, if you're bankrupt when your debts outweigh your assets, uh, you're, if, you're, if your negative gravitational energy outweighs your positive mass energy and kinetic energy, you are a black hole. Right? So bankruptcy and black hole formation are close analogs here. It's like when black shoals leads to black holes. No, oh, sorry, I think I had to, had to say it. <laughs> All right. So let me, let me close up here by, uh, oh, and here's, of course, the money version of this. Well, we'll see in just a little bit, actually, what happens in the money version of this. But before I tell you what happens in the finance version of this, uh, uh, actually, no, I'll tell you, right, I'll show you right now. Let's see. So this, by the way, this is, the, um, this is a nice picture taken out of a paper um, from uh, uh, like about six or seven years ago. This represents the uh, overnight deposit structure of the banking, international banking industry, just in 2007, just before the financial crisis. This is the halo. Almost all the points on the halo are just exchanging money with a few banks in the core. Here is the core. There's something like 30 highly connected banks, and you can see they're exchanging vast amounts of of, uh, of money and IOUs overnight. You know, over, banks have to have money in their systems overnight to conform with deposit requirements. So every night there's this gigantic scramble where you know, the banks have to, have to borrow money so it's in the in bank overnight and they return it in the morning with a teeny payment at back. But in order to stabilize this system, you've got to have very, very high amount of activity going on in the core and that's exactly what's going on. This is what the theory predicts, this is what was actually happening. <clears throat> and of course, you know, when, when uh, this froze up, as happened basically overnight during the financial crisis, the whole thing went kerblooey. All right, let me just go back to the last thing. I, I haven't really talked much about life. I talked almost all about gravitational systems and finance, but let me just say a few words about this. The same kind of creation process happens in life. The hot sun has flows of very high temperature energy, thousands of degrees, to the Earth. This means there's flows of free energy, usable energy, flowing from the hot sun to the Earth. And in turn, the Earth is rejecting heat, thermal heat, out into cold outer space. And by a mechanism that's very similar to, but not identical to the one I described, what this happens is when you drive these systems in this fashion, this causes chemical systems to start to aggregate free energy into form structure. Bits of chemical reactions start to cooperate with each other to take more and more advantage of this solar energy that's coming in. Pretty soon you have some kind of proto-photosynthesis going on. And sooner or later you get little vesicles forming. They can do photosynthesis. And if the ability to aggregate free energy, this kind of clumping of this energy due to this natural thermodynamic driving, allows the formation of more complex structures like fish who are eating the bacteria or the eating the plankton right here, then you're good to go. You're off and running. So I say that I'll claim, I claim that this picture gives us a nice origins, proto-origins of life story. Though let's be, let's be honest about this in the same way you know that Newton's laws are much more precise than the laws of economics. We know a hell of a lot more about the origin of the universe than we know about the origin of life on Earth which is kind of a sad and pathetic situation for scientists to be in, it is nonetheless true. Okay, and here of course, are, you know, here's Fisher, you know, the, the little poisson is eating some plankton that Fisher has baited his hook with. Here's Walrus again, 
showing the unity of all this picture. That this, is, this is my way of demonstrating to you the unity of the picture that I'm describing to you. <coughs> At least cartoon unity. <coughs> so, uh, just to summarize, um, uh, if you look at gravitational systems, for reasons having to do with when information flows around, they have a natural tendency to cluster and to aggregate. This is a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, together with this funny gravitational feature that they're unstable. Uniform distributions are unstable. They like to go to increasingly dense and concentrated distributions. When I apply this to ideas from classical economics, then you find, oh, you can just map it right over by this nice formalism that dates back really up more than 100 years um, and made more precise recently. And you find, oh, we've got this nice formalism about equilibrium and in economic systems, equilibrium in, in thermodynamic systems. But because economic systems have assets and debt, and because you can have things like increasing leverage or increasing returns to scale, they actually, many of them are intrinsically unstable. This is an example of such an unstable system, the overnight internet bank, uh, interbank deposit network. Uh, when, when, it, uh, when it shut down in 2008, the whole thing collapsed. It was a big disaster. And you got something that looked a lot like this. And this is the cat's eye nebula. False color image, I might say. But this is the cat's eye nebula. This is the outcome of a gravothermal catastrophe. It's a star that there was a star here. The star burned through nuclear, nuclear, nuclear fuel. It collapsed. And then it blew all this stuff out into this halo. Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, so uh, uh, this is uh, an example of creative destruction in the sense that at least it created a pretty cool image and complicated structure. I would claim that this collapsing was a more of an example of what I call destructive destruction. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>
And systems are stable when the right information gets to the right place at the right time. You know, my body is a metabolic system that has, has millions and millions of signals going on at any moment, and there are feedback signals that says, okay, regulate your temperature to this level. All right, very, regulate your salinity to this level. You know, time to eat an apple, right, stuff like that. So when things are good and, and, and systems have had co-evolved to a point where they have stable kinds of information flows going between them, then the information is usually the right information to be the right place at the right time. Once it goes unstable, all bets are off, uh, an example. And what happens then can be quite disconcerting. And I'm not just talking about Twitter, right? Uh, uh, you know. So information, whose who is, you know, traditional human purpose is to communicate and to build things together, then can just become some kind of tool where all these messages are flowing around, and they can just as equally tear things down as build things up. I mean, a good example of this is, you know, when I was a young man, a meme was a cultural thing like good parenting. Good parenting causes children to grow healthy and they adopt good parenting skills and so good parenting propagates through the population. This is Richard Dawkins' original notion of a meme. What is a meme now? A meme, as I discovered to my horror when I started writing an article about memes last year, my children said, no, that's not a meme. A meme is a stupid picture on the internet with a really dumb caption and I indeed look for images of memes and that's what it is. It's gone, like that's what a meme is now. This nice kind of Dawkinsian idea of good parenting being a meme has been like, ironically, the word meme has now become a meme. It now means something like dumb pictures with dumb captions on the internet. So I mean, I think we are, we are living in an era where there's this, there's this total instability in terms of information production. Uh, the vast majority of messages that are flying around are probably complete garbage. And unfortunately, we have to sift out the ones that aren't. Sorry, that was, I got a little out of control there, please. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so I have a question about the slide where you put side by side the entropy and uh, the utility function. I think it was a, towards oh, the yeah. beginning of the... Yeah. Are we still on there? Well, it doesn't matter, it's just, just it like is, a... It doesn't really matter. But yeah. um, so the, the answer to my question might be as simple as my interpretation is wrong, but... Um, when I saw that slide, I was thinking, okay, well, so you give a dollar, you get an apple. Uh, but surely, this, in that formula, either the value, so th there, there is the idea of value that's not in that equation, basically. And yeah. uh, maybe the parallel can be made between value and energy, and in case of physics, energy is conserved. But in, a, in the case of human society, value evolves over time, right? Yeah. And so I, I, I wonder if we could, I mean, if you could say something about this, if, if my interpretation is wrong, if the two are not actually the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can say something. Well, first, I'll just say something technical, which is that, you know, what is the price? How many, how many pounds per apple? Well, the price is the marginal utility of the apple divided by the marginal utility of money, right? You know, D, D pounds, D apple is um, D, uh, D, U, uh, D utility, D apple divided by D utility, D, D pound, right? You know, this is, that's what it is in classical economics if you believe in utility. But of course, the notion of utility, uh, it's, it's not clear what utility is. It's not clear how you measure it, except at looking at what people, how people exchange things, and then you try to infer what their utility might be. It's, of course, as is famously the case in you know, non-classical economics, it's famously not even well-defined in the sense that people may have preferences that are not well-ordered. It certainly changes all the time. That's why I think that, you know, <clears throat> I think that, and this is, you know, it's a hopeful gesture, a hopeful mathematical gesture to say, well, let's look at financial information and the information that people are exchanging, the information in contracts and in IOUs and in portfolios. This is something we can measure. We don't have to say, hey, it's some utility. And there's a question here as well. Sue Roberts from South Oxfordshire Sustainability. Last time I came to the Oxford Martin School, we had a talk about um, the growth in clean, green energy. Mm -hmm. And I asked whether economic growth was ever sustainable if we want to keep within our resources. May I say I was assured. there and it was a great question. It was a great question. Yeah, so, and yeah. so what is your view on that? Yeah, I, I think I would say, yeah, uh, this, the general argument here suggests we should be careful, right? And, and you know, we, 
indeed, if we just have completely unfettered free markets, but a lot of them are unstable, you know, in these, when these instabilities dominate, you no longer expect a market um, mechanism to give a good allocation of resources. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in Adam Smith, right? You know, that, that you know, people are competing with each other, looking out for their own good, and when things are right, you know, in this nice stable regime, then markets are very good ways of allocating resources, better than other ways, because you know, people are voting with what they want to do. But we should not necessarily believe that that's always going to be the case in markets, just as, for instance, the market for, for funky mortgage-backed securities during the financial crisis, it turned out it was unstable and it was really bad. It was destructive destruction. So <clears throat> uh, if I actually recall the way that you phrased it at the, the, this meeting about sustainable energy, I think, and the, to synthesize that with the things that were said at that meeting and other meetings during the Martin School, you know, I think the situation is very hopeful that, that you know, one thing that happens is that, that people have lots of ideas to make things sustainable. The technologies are actually there, and with extra investment, the prices per you know, solar watt hour are going down dramatically. And I would say that by a judicious combination of having people competing and then also having guidance from society as a whole, I think we might make our way out of this global warming mess we're in right now. I'm afraid the key word there was judicious. <laughs> yeah, there were a couple of more questions, actually. One of the things that came to my mind while I was listening to you um, analogize between thermodynamics and economics was the analogies that you could apply to chemical kinetics because your big K is really small K over small K, if you like, the forward reaction and the back reaction. And the analogy of the information transfer being so damn fast today that it outruns our thinking power. So that last diagram you put up really it shows the essence of this huge information explosion that we really don't know what's happening with our few pounds or our few dollars that have been invested into a company because the company doesn't exist anymore because somebody in an office somewhere has pressed a button and shifted our stock from A to B to C and the whole thing's gone belly up. It's a bit like a chain reaction, isn't it? Do, do you see it like that? Yeah, indeed. Well, this is what we were just talking about lunch to, to, about this today. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> One of the, uh, and actually this is, I think that I can, you know, I am a professor of mechanical engineering. After all, I have no background in mechanical engineering. It's like my first graduate degree was in philosophy. <laughs> uh, philosophy of information and quantum mechanics, as it turns out. Um, but uh, uh, in, you know, engineered systems have these interlocking feedback loops. The way you make a moon rocket or a robot or a car is that you have feedback loops that make sure things are doing the right thing. And the timing of these feedback loops is crucial. If you crank up the gain in a system, so you feedback the information too fast, or if the system out, out, uh, outruns the speed of your feedback loop, this induces instability. Actually, by the way, it's, it's in fact just a kind of a, a, um, a lower, well, I'll do it like this. It's, it's a lower, uh, it's like a simpler version of this core halo instability. And so this, this, um, the sign that things are getting out of whack <coughs> are, that, are that the feedback loops that regulate a system, that, the, that you know, things start changing so fast that they can no longer regulate it. And I, I think that's certainly true about some aspects of the economy. So unfortunately, Bitcoin went up and crashed, went down so fast I didn't have time actually to even uh, uh, lose money. <laughs> so I think in the interest of drinking, I will allow one last question, probably. I mean, history shows that you know, economic, this, uh, markets are, have their own economic cycles. You know, isn't, 2008 was probably not the first time we have financial crisis. No. There's a Great Depression. And how do you see that sort of experience fit into your analogy, uh, this sort of cycles? Oh, uh, I think that, that leverage should not be an increasing, an increasing function of wealth. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's pretty, th this kind of thing, I'm not, in some sense, a lot of the things I'm saying are not rocket science at all, right? 
what does it say, okay, you know, maybe Lehman Brothers could say, oh, leverage should be an increasing function of wealth because we're so smart that we can predict what's going to happen with the market, so you should give us a lot more money so we can make a lot more money. I just say that's bullshit, you know. Once you're in this unstable regime, the smartest people can't predict or what's going to happen. And so, you know, leverage shouldn't look like, like, like that as a function of wealth. It should look like this as a function of wealth. Or heck, it could just be flat as a function of wealth. I mean, actually, I would think it's much, you know, let, let, let entrepreneurs be highly leveraged and let big investment banks be more like big commercial banks and have reserve requirements. I know it's not rock, this is not rocket science, it's just what's actually in the th regulations like Dodd-Frank that people in the United States are trying to undo even as we speak. <clears throat> is that going to be quick? One more question. So maybe, yeah. I think you need the microphone yeah, because yeah. we're being recorded yeah. as well. So. Hi, so you talked about the core halo instability yeah. and about how information traveling very, very efficiently and quickly through the core yeah. uh, is very beneficial. And then you talked about like 30 banks as your example. Yeah. What if you would just simply increase the type, the amount of banks in the core, and then may, maybe maybe that wouldn't implode as much, or you at least would delay the implosion. So would that be a viable solution instead of? Yeah, and to translate into sort of ordinary economic terms, if you know, if you you insist that these banks in the core be not highly leveraged, for instance, that means you do need more banks in the core, right? If they're going to lend out more money to the people on the periphery, you could actually, you know. You could, you could have more banks in the core, and you could also allow them, but you could allow them to exchange more, uh, more money in debt with them. Those things both go together in stabilizing it. Um, yeah, so, so I don't know what the solutions are there. I mean, there are plenty of people in this room who know a lot, heck of a lot more about economics than, than I do. Um, but yeah, I do know that, you know, I, I, I think I, I would say that leverage shouldn't be an increasing function of net wealth. That, that I think probably pretty straight to say if you're. <laughs> okay. Um, I think um, I have to make just a very quick announcement, actually, uh, that there is a uh, last in the health series uh, at the OMS uh, next Thursday, 8th of March. And this is um, Planetary Health by Professor Sir Andrew Haynes at five o'clock, like uh, this one, and there will be a reception afterwards. Um, I hope you enjoyed the drinks. Keep your money in your mattress. And let's thank Seth for this inspirational talk. <laughs>